Greetings and salutations, all you beautiful people. Welcome back to League Unlock. Eric and Mark here with you for the most serious, high stakes, important video that we may ever do on this channel. We're continuing the trend of counting down historically positions from T1 and the most important, the longest, most difficult to put together. We're talking about the mid lane list. This is very, very serious. I gotta highlight it. There's a lot of guys here who have completely changed the trajectory of this organization. And by a lot of guys, it summed up all at the very top into one guy. Yeah, but Mr. who's Baker. number one? It's a mystery. We don't know. <laughs> I'll let you guys figure that one out on your own as we get into this one. But there are some players that I think a lot of people might have forgotten or might have, you know, uh, kind of looked over during their time at T1. There are some important contributions still made other than just Faker in that mid lane for T1. Let's have a little trip down memory lane and enjoy the mid lane of SKT and T1. Yeah, and the majority of this whole list is just basically going to be trivia questions for you. If you remember these different eras, we start with a couple of guys who played a combined three games for the starting squad for SKT, but two guys who went on to win MVPs in other leagues. We're talking about Scout and Gory. Scout played a grand total of two games, one in the Kespa Cup, and he subbed in for one game in the 2016 uh, spring split where he was playing a little bit of Lulu duty to help out Mr. Bang. This is less about what, you know, the T1 organization did for these players to help prop them up type of situation. Or, you know, oh my God, T1, they're the only ones that could have seen this talent. It's not a situation like that. But it is important to remember and look back and identify that they were scouted out and they were picked up by the T1 organization. And you can see why what has happened with their careers, the type of potential players that they could be and, and everything else. Now their performances with T1, I think there is a lot to be desired from both of these ones. There's the just not much games. to go on because, again, three games. Sure, they were often in the challenger scene uh, a lot more, or the academy team kind of building up. And we've highlighted many a times, and we've seen over the years, T1 is just a talent factory. When you are the premier organization, just look at Reckless joining the academy team. Teams are flocking and signing up to not even make it to that starting squad just for kind of the the clout it is to be involved in this org. It really has been this trip down memory lane and looking back through the T1 organization, through the SKT eras and going through these players. And one of the things that does come up a lot is identifying that, wow, this is just developed talent on their own, bringing them into the organization, helping raise them up to that top level and pushing them to be the best players that they can be. The T1 Academy, T1 organization, absolutely great at that. In the mid lane, you're going to see the examples of that, even with the titanic block that is Faker holding down that spot. And obviously the reality is when Faker has played 10 years, 1,200 games with the organization, there's not many spots left for some of these other guys, which is why dropping in that number five spot is a guy who became a meme basically before his career even started, and that is Mr. Poby, who subbed in in the 2023 summer split when Faker had his wrist injuries. We know how it went down. The squad proceeded to go 1-7. and seven. He went 4-14 and 14 overall, and I know it's the easy answer to just flame this guy and say, what? He wasn't as good as Faker, but think of the scenario this guy was put in. 17 years old. He was born in 2006, Mark. I was already raiding in World of Warcraft by then. What type of situation are you stepping into where anyone would expect that young player to be able to step up, deliver, communicate, I mean, process the game all the type of way that not only a veteran of the time that Faker has been in there, but the pedigree and category of player that he is at absolutely unbelievable that people would put any of those type of expectations towards Poby. I think what we have seen from Poby that is important to mention with his T1 time is a very successful career through the academy so far, really showing that potential, showing those signs. And this was one of those ones where it seems that opportunity too big, too early for a player like Poby in that type of situation. And there's absolutely no shame in that one. When you look at that one, hey, we are the Poby fan club over here at League Unlocked, we got our boys back. And it's not like it was a planned, now's the time to bring this guy up. Like we said, it, 
an emergency substitution scenario. And remember, when he was first getting dropped in, he was confident. Laning face, he was playing super aggressively. We just remember the few moments where he gets caught out or is not on the same page with his team. And again, anyone watching T1 during that eight series stretch saying Poby was the main issue, the other four members turned their brains off for four weeks. Yeah, and it's it's the combined factor as well that you need to look at, you know, how, how, what was going on with his teammates, his own individual play. And as you mentioned, the laning phase, everything else that you're looking hyper focused on him for the most part. Yes, there's a couple of mistakes here or there that comes with the inexperience and everything else. But it's still passed the test to me for someone that can continue to grow, can be one of these prospects in the T1 system, which is, of course, one of the main benefits of having such a superstar like Faker hold down that spot is you can afford a little bit more patience, a little bit more of a time to look at some of these guys. Poby, right now, early track record, the expectations of T1 fans, and especially the expectations that were on T1 when he stepped into the lineup of how they had already performed that year. This guy's got to deserve a little bit of a break. Happy to mention him here in this list to provide a little bit of context as well for some of the other players and where they are in T1's history. And very happy that T1 brought him back for 2024 to continue his growth in the academy team and underneath, you know, the greatest of all time in Faker. But despite some good looking moments, you still got to put somebody like, period? SKT, period? A spot ahead of him. And I know he was only there one split. He only played like 20 games with them. But even in the dark times of 2018, there were still multiple individual pop-off moments that we saw from Pyrian on Oriana, on Swain. People were, I know, memeing at the time, but they were going, Faker who? <laughs> oh, man. I, I got to give credit because this is one of those ones where when I initially think about Pyrian with T1, my very first reaction is to remember all those mornings that, you know, I'd wake up super early, watch LCK, and you'd be waiting to find out what that starting roster was going to be for T1 on the day. And you found out it was Pyrian. Ah, you're closing the stream most likely and you're going to bed type of situation. But if you were doing that, you were missing out. Because not only I can understand, obviously, the disappointment of not having that superstar faker play. And of course, in hindsight, all these things. But what was delivered that year and the way that he stepped up and did challenge himself to the rest of the LCK's top level and come out on top more often than not, Tyrion deserves his credit for his time and his stay during T at T1. Still the only split they missed playoffs as an organization he barely played 20 games again having Pyrian at number four just speaks to how how thin the barrel is that we're pulling from other mid lanes to rank in t1's history to put it in perspective you catch yesterday's one talking about the top lane pretty much as soon as you get past number seven we're talking about the greatest of all time type of top laners a little bit different when don't you even have through. seven guys to choose from here you know, but you know what? The guy sitting on the top of the throne is worth more than all seven guys combined. So that's what it is for the T1 mid lane. Now, when Pyrian was subbing in, people were laughing. When is Faker coming back? The guy ahead of him, when Closer was coming into the starting lineup, especially when he was playing Zoe or Akali, you remember that debut where he gets a triple kill on Zoe. People were unironically saying Closer should be starting more games over Faker here. Yes, they were. And that was kind of one of the very first indications to a lot of people that, you know what, as, as great, as fantastic as the unkillable Demon King is, there will be a time that someone will rise up and take that starting spot from him. Now, you look back at this one when it happened with Closer and you realize we're still at that yeah, point. Three years nobody, later, that still hasn't happened. That's, we're not at that point where someone is able to usurp the unkillable Demon King. But Closer is still an art in a fantastic player in his own right. When you look at him and is still carved out his own starting spot, his own legacy within the LCK that he's now forging for himself. So I'd like to see that from his future path. But as time with T1, you're right. It is that initial hot prodigy looking through and seeing what type of prospect is, is you know, studying under Faker and what he can do. And Closer was really the first and almost only example that we have seen someone step right into that role and hit the ground running. Yeah, it's kind of, you know, you compare it to the scenario Poby was thrown into. It was 
Similar for Closer, although T1 was a lot more of a mess when Closer was getting subbed in. But yeah, immediately, the first couple of games at the very least, you were excited for Closer. He had the mechanics. Maybe Faker wasn't in his finest form in 2020. So Closer, a little bit more of a body of work. A couple of splits he was with the squad. Warrants that number three spot. Number two is the only guy who was legitimately taking games from Baker and the most impactful on this list because I'm speculating here but I'm gonna say this guy is the reason why Faker is so damn good at Azir now because in 2015 Easy Hoon was the Azir specialist 7-0 on the champion getting subbed in because worldwide he was the best Azir in the world. There's no better time to talk about the torch being passed from Easy Hoon's Azir to Faker's Azir than after this year in the World Championships, the performances that we saw. You're right. There's been so many times everybody would initially just go, yeah, of course, SKT Azir. That's that's Faker, right? Like, if, mm -mm, that's my boy, Easy Hoon, stepping on in. You go back, we were just talking about, you know, Pyrian, you weren't excited about him jumping in that starting lineup. Closer, there was some excitement. There was some hype about it. There absolutely was excitement when Easy Hoon would step in for Faker in, the, in these situations back in 2015, the level that he carried himself at, as well as knowing what type of leader he was behind the scene with T1 and that type of role that he carried. I think a lot of where Faker has developed and matured into that type of icon for the team, you got to be looking back at that early influence from a player like Easy Hoon. And he has one of the greatest quotes of all time, asked about why their substitution works. And he just says, uh, isn't it possibly just because I'm good? And <laughs> that that's the number one reason, my dude. Oh, 10 out of 10 right there for Mr. Easy Hoon. He's one of my favorites. When I look back at that era of League of Legends and what was happening, and especially that T1 dynasty, the SKT dynasty that emerges in that you know 2014 2016 17 type of window easy hoon is a major part of why that gets off the ground and why faker is able to initially be that mega superstar i think it is absolutely part of that contribution from easy hoon off the rift on the rift both of them i'm willing to give that credit yeah it was i feel like him probably being pushed by Easy Hoon, which is something he has rarely had, it feels like, from at least the substitute mid laners within the squad. So big shout outs to Easy Hoon, deserving of the second best mid laner in the history of T1. And then it brings us to the dramatic number one spot that really is just an excuse to throw some of Faker's numbers on a board because that's always an absolute treat. And the one that always sticks out to me, he's played 1,200 games and has a 68% win rate if you had that in solo queue you would be 2,000 points ahead of whoever's second it's actually bonkers you know a lot of these things when i'm pulling through the stats for these players you're separating it out and it's oh it's this season or you know i'm going you know this split or whatever you can go to faker's page and you can set it to all all statistics and you see that body of work and it's just insane to look through what the unkillable demon king has done the consistency of excellency is unmatched, I think, in arguably esports. And, you know, you can only really compare it to traditional sports. I think the only place you can find that type of longevity, that type of excellence from the very tippity top of your superstar, Baker delivers. I think what you have to do more so, obviously, doing it. T1 mid lane ranking is kind of hilarious, but you almost need to go through the eras of who's the next one to take down Faker. Because you can go through a long list through Pawn, GBM, BDD comes in, Chovy comes in. There's always the next guy who's here to dethrone Faker and he just he outlasts them all. At some point, we even stopped looking within the mid lane for the comparable for Faker and had to go, is it Smeb in the top lane? Is he the guy? Maybe it's you Uzi. Had to, you had to pull from other roles to try and take down the king of the mid lane. You can't do it. And Faker this year, after all these years, to talk about him at number one, of course, solidified with that fourth world championship title. That one was for his teammates, for his fans, everybody. Loving to see him capture that title and really showing that longevity in his career that he still turns it on. He's still the best player in the world. 
Riot needs to put a statue of this guy outside of their headquarters because he single-handedly has been keeping this esport alive now for the last few years. Um, yeah, and we've talked about it big time for sure. The way that he handles himself in front of the media with the fans and everything else on his stream, you could not have asked for a more perfect miracle for Riot Games to have as an iconic player to help lift their game up. A lot of other esports, a lot of traditional sports can't say they're as lucky as Riot Games is with a player like Faker. T1, of course, the home of him and enduring everything else, and they're looking after our boy, and we're feeling good about it. Even if League of Legends and T1 exist into the 2100s, Faker is still going to be coming out on top of this list. But that is it today for League Unlock. Eric and Mark here with you, beauties. Thanks for watching, as always, and we'll catch you on that flippity flip.